Okay, guys, we're ready to start. I'm Terry Gomez with DOSpedia. I run our customer relations team. Today's webinar topic is Introduction to Digital DOS and CIPRI, presented by Dolly Wireless, sponsored by NEDAS. This webinar is accredited by Big C. If you're a Big C member, you'll receive one continuing education credit by attending. Please contact us afterwards, and we'll provide you with a copy of your certificate. Our speaker today is Dolly Wireless, Gary Spedelier. Our host today is John Hayes. John has been our chief editor since our inception. He has a BS in physics and astronomy, getting his start working on the Chandra X-ray Telescope at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He is responsible for DOSpedia's content management and a part of our strategic development team. In his spare time, John's an award-winning fiction author. So, John, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Terry. All right, wonderful. Why don't you take it from here? Okay, thank you very much, Terry. Uh, everyone, thank you for uh, joining us. We're happy to have you here. Um, as Terry said, my name is John Hayes. I'm Daspedia's chief editor, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a training and educational firm for the DAS and in-building wireless industry. Before I hand our webinar over to our guest speaker, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Daspedia and how we got started. The wireless industry has evolved over the last few years from being carrier-centric to more enterprise-driven. We noticed that many enterprise-level IT professionals are being tasked with solving complex RF-oriented in-building coverage issues. With this in mind, we saw a need to educate enterprise-level customers um, and end-users to the basics of wireless inf infrastructure. Daspedia provides online, on-site, and group DAS 101 training courses to enterprise-level customers. We identify and work with innovative companies pushing the boundaries in this arena. We believe Dolly Wireless is a disruptor in wireless technology, and that's why we invited them here today. We're, we're positioning ourselves as a networking hub for all telecom professionals. To that end, our motto is learn, share, and prosper. We welcome telecom professionals from multiple verticals ranging from government, uh, defense and military, uh, higher education, all the way to hospitality, healthcare, um, transportation hubs, and, and even commercial and real estate. As part of this effort, um, DOSpedia is putting together regional training seminars and networking events. Our next event will be held at the University of California Irvine campus in Orange County, California on January 11, 2016. A few sponsorship opportunities are still available. So if your company is interested, uh, please contact us. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you there. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I want to draw your attention to a couple things. Um, one is the chat box on the right side of your screen um, on the webinar control panel. We're going to have a short Q&A session after the presentation. So if you have any questions, you can uh, put the, uh, type them in that box and, and they'll be sent to me. Also, you can download documents related to this presentation um, now, actually, from the handout section above the chat box uh, on the webinar control panel. This material is also available on our daspedio.com website in the vault section. Um, one more thing, for those who are BISCI members, like Terry said, you will earn one CEC credit for attending this webinar. Please contact us afterwards via email at info at dospedia.com. That's info, I-N-F-O, at dospedia.com uh, to get your certificate for completion. Uh, with that, I think it's time to introduce today's speaker. Our speaker comes from Dally Wireless. His name is Gary Spedelier. He has over 40 years of diversified domestic and international experience in product design, development, and implementation of both commercial and public safety radio systems. These include macro networks and distributed antenna systems. He's previously held senior roles at Motorola Canada, ADC, which became TE Connectivity and is now Comscope, PowerWave, 
Philips Radio Communications and RFS. Gary, are you there? I am here. Thank you very much. All right, I'll give it to you. Okay, and again, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, John and Terry. Um, also, if you haven't done so, Sayola did offer a course on DAS 101, which is an introduction to DAS. Uh, I reviewed that myself before I, I put this presentation together, and that's a good introduction to DAS. Uh, also, we are going to be at the seminar in, in Irvine, so we'll be uh, presenting this again there. And then the other thing is uh, I wanted to thank Wendy Har, who is marketing director at Dally Wireless. Uh, she's largely responsible for the content of this presentation and put a lot of work in to make it what it is. Okay, now just to make sure, can everybody see my screen fine? Now it works. Yeah, now we can see it. Thank you. All right. Sayola is the one that keeps me in line, everybody, so just so you know that I'm glad he spoke up. Okay. I'll just go through this again on DAS. Um, what is DAS? Radio signals from one or more base stations fed to multiple antennas. And the key here is delivering the signals with pinpoint accuracy where they are needed. And again, it's a distributed antenna system. We take a signal source and distribute it out to where coverage and capacity is needed. DAS supports multiple operators on a single system what we call a neutral host system sometimes, but in a typical uh, enterprise building, stadium, what you want to do is have service available from all of the operators. It supports multiple technologies on a single system. So we've done 2G, 3G, 4G, we'll do 5G, Wi-Fi can be supported as well in some DAS systems. The signal strength in a DAS system can be optimized for coverage and capacity. And both of those are important. Mobile phones in a, that are covered by a DAS system are typically closer to the antenna. That means they're putting out less power. That means we're extending the battery life. So again, it's another benefit of a DAS system. Things to consider, dollars. A DAS is an adjunct to a base station. So it adds cost to whatever system you're looking at. The other thing to consider is optimization time of the DAS system. Analog DAS can take quite a while to get everything fully optimized. It's actually easier with a digital system in the, in the way we've implemented it, but it's something to consider when you install the DAS system. There's the optimization time to make sure the network is operating exactly as designed. The evolution of audio, I got sidetracked here, but it'll help in a minute. Um, we started off with analog, and if you're as old as I am, you remember um, black vinyl uh, cassettes. Uh, that migrated to digital in the form of CDs originally. And within the last few years, we've migrated towards streaming. So today, my kids have no physical media. Everything they listen to is streamed over the internet and that's how they listen to music. If you look at the evolution of DAS, it's following a similar path. We started off with analog DAS. It migrated, or is still in the process of migrating to digital DAS. And then the next step in DAS is RAN virtualization. And at that point, I'm not sure if that is really still a DAS system, but it's something that's really important. It's something that's taking place today, and it's a topic that I'll discuss in a little more detail at the end of this presentation. What we're doing here is we're trying to drive towards the lowest total cost of ownership and the optimum quality of service. So for the operators, they want to keep their system as low as cost as possible. Customers want to have the best possible customer experience. Okay, we're back on topic, analog versus digital. <laughs> if you look at the, the top drawing here, what you can see is that we've got a base station, 
connected by a fiber to the head end, and from the head end, excuse me, connected to the head end via coax cable, and then via fiber to the remote. And the base station puts out an RF signal, connected that, possibly attenuated the head end, and fiber used to transmit it to the remote or remote. In the digital solution, you've got the same base station, the same connection, coax cable into the head end. At the head end, that analog signal from the base station, the analog RF, is converted into a digital signal, and that digital signal is sent over the fiber to the remote. And the key here is you can see that all of the transmission is in the digital domain. And then the other thing to consider is that as systems have evolved, we have remote radio heads connected to baseband units or a digital unit. And what we can do now is we can make a connection via fiber to the head end. The head end takes that digital signal and it's transmitted to the remote. And DALI has some proprietary in, uh, applications around this. Essentially, by using an open API, we can take a SIPRI signal from any operator, put it into our system here, and transmit it. And in that case, the remote becomes a remote radio head specific to the original equipment manufacturer that did the baseband unit, and put that signal out together with any other signals on the remote. And you can see in this system here, everything is digital until we get to the remote and convert it to an RF signal, an analog signal for connection to the antenna. Give me a second here. If we look at this slide here in analog DAS, and ignore my little highlights there, but analog DAS has been around since the 1980s. In analog DAS, we take the radio inputs from the base station I showed earlier. We mix or combine them in the analog domain. And this can be done. It's been done for years. It is difficult to avoid interference problems when we are mixing a lot of signals in the analog domain from multiple base stations, multiple operators, and possible multiple technologies. And the reason this is important is that those interfering signals will reduce the throughput on the system, which means the user experience can be degraded. The analog radio signal is used to drive a laser diode. And this is similar to uh, driving a light bulb in time with music. And Wendy provided the little graphics here. Um, I think that goes back to the disco area. But in essence, the RF signal drives the, the RF signal drives the, the laser diode, and then that modulated light output is sent down the fiber to the remote. At the remote, the signal's converted back into a radio signal. In an analog DAS system, linearity and aging of the laser needs to be closely monitored. So what an analog DAS system is, it's essentially a media converter that converts the RF to an analog optical signal and back again to a radio frequency signal for the connection to the antenna. The losses in the fiber will degrade the noise performance, and that means that will have a lower throughput in the system. And I'm not being negative about analog DAS systems. The vendors of analog DAS systems have had since the 1980s to do the best possible job they can within the limitations of the technology. But it is still an analog system that we're using 
and it has all the limitations of an analog system. Sayola, just quickly, can I get rid of those uh, highlights? Be able to have to find the panel somewhere where you have uh, found those uh, highlighters and have to just unclick it and you should go away. If not, um, I will take it over and just uh, show you your slides on my screen and you can try to follow it. It should be Look right that on way then. Yeah, I you did click on it, it didn't disappear. All right, so let me let me launch my screen. All right, so you're good, right? You can see it. We're good. We're good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, if we want to go to the next slide then. In fact, I've got control of this. Okay, digital DAS. In digital DAS, the radio input signals are converted to digital signals, ones and zeros. The digital signals are combined in the digital domain, and essentially all we're doing is adding ones and zeros, and this is distortion-free. This is a huge help in avoiding intermod problems when you're combining multiple carriers or multiple modulation techniques from different base stations. The digital signals, the ones and zeros, turn an SFP on and off. An SFP is a, in our case, a standard small form factor pluggable transceiver. And you can see the picture of the device here along with the dime, a dime to give you some idea of the size. It is a very small device. It's about the size of your small finger. It's a standard device very commonly used in data communication. Uh, there are now devices available for SIPRI, specifically for SIPRI, optimized for SIPRI data rates. But once again, it's a standard device. It's been around for a long time and it provides, in our case, two wavelengths over a single fiber, WDM. It can be in a, a duplex mode where you have two wavelengths over two fibers, but we use a single fiber. This digital signal is fed to the remote, converted back to RF for transmission to the antenna. So again, the key here is we're working in the digital domain. All signal processing is done in the digital domain and fiber losses do not impact performance. The requirements on the fiber plant installation are not as stringent. So if you're, if you're putting fiber in a building, what you can do is you can, I won't say relax your requirements, you still want to make sure that you've got the, the lowest loss possible, but a digital system is much more forgiving of losses in the fiber installation. It's a really important point it helps you in getting the system up and running as quickly as possible. SIPRI digital DAS. <clears throat> SIPRI digital DAS is, if you want a variety of DAS, the subspecies, the digitized radio signals are sent as packet data, data to the remote. And this is very important. So if you think about this as the internet, the remotes look like individual IP addresses. So we can take the information from multiple base stations, feed it into the head end, packetize it, and then those packets can be framed and sent to individual remotes. So what we have here is true flexibility in sending signals to any remote because we're using SIPRI packet data and we're addressing the remotes just as if they were an IP address. We can optimize the delay in this system to meet the 3GPP requirements with a single click of the GUI. And this is important because in MIMO system, multiple input, multiple output, where you have two transceivers you're doubling the data rate in theory, and the only way you can get that full doubling of the data rate is if the two paths are carefully synchronized 
and we can actually do that on our system to an accuracy of about 35 nanoseconds. How do we do this? It's DALI's patented implementation of CIPRI in a DAS environment. What CIPRI is, is the common public radio interface. It's a specification for the internal interface of a radio base station between the radio equipment control and the radio equipment. And typically what we've done with radios in the last few years is that there is a digital section of a radio, an analog section. If you look at baseband units or digital units, that's the digital portion of the radio, it can be connected over fiber to a remote radio hit. And if you look at the original equipment manufacturers, the major infrastructure providers, all of them offer radios in this configuration. In some cases, they're in the same package. In some cases, the remotes are mounted at the top of towers to give you a wider coverage area. But the interface between that baseband unit and the remote radio head is the common public radio interface. And it's become almost a standard. The goal of CIPRI is to allow base station manufacturers to share a common protocol to easily adapt platforms from one customer to the other. In actual fact, I think every CIPRI vendor, every base station vendor in the world has their own variety of CIPRI. And even though the standard defines how you transfer the modulation information, there are specific uh, operation and management functions embedded within it that are unique to each individual manufacturer. So it's a standard, but everybody has their own variation of the standard. IQ modulation data is delivered as a baseband digital IQ stream, and I won't get into the technology here, but basically we have packet data that we send to the remote and at the remote end, that digital data is used to feed a modulator, which essentially converts this into RF, which is then connected to the antenna. CIPRI is used in the internal interface of radio base stations. But more importantly, and the key part of this, it's used from the head end or the baseband unit or the digital unit to the remote unit and remote radio heads are a way of providing the analog portion of a base station separate from the digital portion. Cyprian DAS. So this is the way DALI has elected to implement their digital DAS system. In the digital DAS system, the base station connected to the head end. So again, as I talked about previously, we have the RF from the base station or multiple base stations fed into the head end or host. It's converted to a SIPRI signal and fed to the remote. We use a modified SIPRI signal. We can also take a baseband unit and feed the SIPRI signal into a head end. We can cascade these, and then we can literally feed over the same fiber both the SIPRI signal and a converted base station signal. Again, it's modified SIPRI that we use in the transport. Why do we modify it? Well, as I said before, um, SIPRI is a standard. We use SIPRI as a standard, but we've actually modified it to get a higher data density than in the standard SIPRI. And again, under the conditions we use it, it's relatively straightforward to do this. We get more bandwidth per gigabit of data. So in the six gig system that DALI has in the market today, we can actually get 164 megahertz of mixed 
RF bandwidth on a single fiber. We can also use this to send packet data uh, for commercial or public safety information or Wi-Fi on the system as well. So as long as all of the signals are within the capability of the data rate we're using, and in our case that's currently either 6 gigs or 10 gigs, we can actually incorporate any digital information into our data stream and then at the other end we can take and feed it into a Wi-Fi access point. We can use it for a public safety system or we can use it for a commercial system. And again the last point is it allows direct connection of the baseband unit. So from our perspective what we've done is we've taken the idea of that we looked at a digital system because we believe there are significant advantages to digital. The loss on the fiber does not affect the RF. We can select the SFPs, the small form factor pluggable transceivers, so that we can go longer distances. Or if you've got a shorter distance, you can select a lower power, lower cost SFP to keep the cost of the entire system down. We can connect multiple remotes. We can integrate Wi-Fi with analog RF with CIPRI. And as we evolve and get to other get to other systems within this, what we're going to see is that the integration of those other pieces of information, be it CIPRI or whatever, are becoming more and more important to the network. SIPRI is a standard, um, basically because most people use it. There are other options besides SIPRI. OBSI is the Open Base Station Architecture Initiative. It's similar to SIPRI. My own opinion is that it might have more flexibility than SIPRI, but it also is somewhat more complicated. But again, it was the same idea. Create an open market for cellular network base stations using a common interface. ORI is the open radio interface and it's really an extension of the CIPRI interface and in the opinion of the people that are, are pushing ORI, CIPRI has restricted compatibility. ORI is designed to specifically clarify previously fine but unclear options. In other words, ORI tries to tighten up the CIPRI specification it also adds addressing capability to CIPRI. And as we evolve the network, this is going to become more and more important because of, of the fact that we're going to use CIPRI to feed multiple base stations, multiple remotes from a single location. And that addressing is becoming a very, very important part of it. And as well, as the network evolves, I'm sure that in the future we're going to see other options that become important as well. Benefits of dis digital and software reconfigurable radio. So this is the advertisement for DALI, but I believe that these things are all valid. Um, what we're trying to do is satisfy the current requirements, providing a seamless migration path to future networks, and this is very important. We work really hard to make sure that we maintain the value of the installed infrastructure of the operators. Part of the value of any major wireless operator is the capital investment they've made in the network and we are very, very careful to maintain the value of that investment while we migrate to the future network. What we believe digital provides is the optimal user experience. We can have a greater reach without signal degradation. And the reason for that is the longer the fiber in an analog system, the more noise or more loss you get in the system. What this translates to is the maximum data throughput capacity in the network is 
increase because we're minimizing the noise interference. The second part of this is a seamless migration without rip and replace. The DALI digital DAS system provides the foundation for network evolution. RAN or radio access, access network virtualization, software defined network, self optimizing network, all of these things are possible within a digital network, a digital DAS system. The system's flexible and scalable. It can be easily expanded and upgraded through plug and play modules and software upgrades. All of our remotes actually have uh, the intelligence in an FPGA, so they are fully upgradable as the network evolves. And what we're looking at is a converged solution for 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, 5G as it evolves, uh, GPON, gigabit passive optical networks, where we're making use of an existing fiber infrastructure. And all of these things are important. And why at Valley we believe that a digital system is absolutely the way to go. Going back to my first slide again, or one of my first slides, just to reiterate, in an analog DAS system, the signal from the base station or base stations is fed into a head end. It's fed in in a analog form over cable. And I don't know if any of you noticed recently, but ALU announced uh, earlier this week that they were making available their products with a very low output power. One of the reasons is that it simplifies the interface to the head end. And if all of the other major equipment manufacturers follow ALU, it, it will reduce the cost to the operators of a DAS system or to the enterprise system. We're still mixing in the analog domain. We still have to be careful, but it will certainly reduce the cost. So we're seeing constant evolution in this, even in the analog solution. On the digital side, Again, traditionally base stations are fed in over cable, multiple base stations into a head end, and they're converted to digital for transport over fiber and then reconverted back at the remote. And the key thing here is the capabilities you have in reducing the impact of fiber losses. You reduce the impact of mixing going into the head end. You add the flexibility of individual addressing if you're using packet data. And then at the bottom, we still have traditional baseband unit, digital unit, depending on who manufactured that particular part of the base station, feeding via fiber directly into the head end and transported as SIPRI data. One of the things that we do is because our native transport is essentially SIPRI, it's relatively straightforward for us to integrate the baseband unit and the digital unit, putting out a SIPRI signal into our head end. Now, the key to all of this, and this is, this is probably the most important point, um, the radio access network virtualization. There are a lot of very good analog DAS systems out there. Um, we believe that a digital DAS system is better than an analog system, but more importantly than where we are today and what we're using today is you've all heard about the radio access network virtualization. And what we believe is the network is heading to the point where in a cloud for the sake of argument, although it won't be a public cloud, it'll be a privately owned data center, the operators will all, all have virtual baseband units or digital units. Content will be fed into those virtual units. This is all done in software. And then you will use an intelligent switch 
and that intelligent switch will feed that content to remotes. This applies to cellular, it applies to public safety, it applies to Wi-Fi, it applies to TV. We all know that AT&T just bought DirecTV. It applies to voice over LTE, which is a in use today. If we look at this evolution of the network, that information from the intelligent switch is not going to be fed by analog means to the remote. It will be a digital signal. And what we're doing, in essence, is we're taking all of what we traditionally consider the core radio access network rebuilding it as software, running at a data center. And the data center is then going through an intelligent switch, probably at 10 gigs or 100 gigs, and be fed by a fiber to the remotes where it's converted to an RF signal and fed to the individual users, individual handsets. This can only be done in a digital system. It cannot be done in an analog system. So as we move forward, the idea of a digital DAS really becomes a part of the radio access network where the entire digital system is relying on that intelligent switch embedded within the, the data center to feed the signal to all the individual remotes. And again, going back, we see the evolution here. This radio access network evolution is key to what we're talking about. It is the key to the operators being able to reduce their costs. It is key to the operators to being able to send high density, high data density content to individual handsets. Um, I don't watch 4K TV on my handset, there are apparently people that are. So just to summarize then, we believe that an all digital software reconfigurable platform enables operators and enterprises to maximize the usage of their existing capital investment while providing them with a seamless migration to the future generation of wireless networks. Thank you. All right. Gary, thank you very much. A uh, really wonderful job. It's very informative. Everyone, this is John Hayes again. Um, thank you for sticking with us. We're going to have now a short Q&A session. Um, let me point out to anyone that joined a little late, um, there's a chat box on the right side of your screen. If you have any questions for Gary, please type them in now. Um, and I will ask them uh, to him for you. We already have a few questions queued, so we will start there. Uh, this one comes from Anil. You didn't mention small cells. Uh, what role do you see them playing in combination with digital DAS systems by Dolly? It's a very good question. Uh, if we talk about het nets or heterogeneous networks, to me, a small cell is just a small, low-power base station. And I think if you look at what ALU announced this week, they see the same thing. So standardization on LTE means that what we're ending up with is a relatively low-cost radio that has full capacity. And that small cell can be used to cover defined area. But because the small cell has full capacity in terms of number of customers, we see this as acting as a feed to a digital DAS system. And in a lot of cases, small cells can be separated into BBUs, uh, the baseband unit, and the remote analog part of it. So more and more, as we evolve the system, I think there's a synergy between small cells today feeding a DAS system, and as it evolves, the digital part of the small cell being used to feed a digital DAS system directly. So small cells are complementary very, very much so to digital DAS systems 
and the important point here is I don't have to attenuate the 100 watts or signal coming out of a big base station. I've got a much lower power small cell, which is easier to integrate into DAF. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question is from David. How many remote nodes can DALI's head end head in unit support, and how are they deployed? Okay, that's a good question, and the answer is it depends. Um, I actually gave this answer to a, a, a customer yesterday, a very knowledgeable customer, and he said to me, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> the answer, yeah, the answer is complicated. First of all, uh, a digital DAS system, an analog DAS system, it's RF. So one of the key factors is how much noise do you get by adding in several remote units? If you look at a, a macro system, an outdoor system, you're typically going to run somewhere in the order of, of four to six remote units per sector of a base station simply because the RF environment outside is going to add so much noise to the system that it will degrade the throughput. If you look at an in-building system where you put in a DAS because you've got no RF coming in, what you can do is just keep adding the number of remotes you need to cover the building. We could cover a university campus, and our head end enables you to feed six remotes directly if you did a, a star configuration, or you can daisy chain them. So we can keep adding remotes. The limitation is primarily the noise figure of the system. And then the other thing that comes into play is the total delay in the system. But an individual remote adds very little delay. So for an in-building system, we haven't seen a building yet that we couldn't put all the remotes in that we needed to cover that building. What drives the sectorization and how many remotes per sector is really the capacity required in the system number of users. Okay. Uh, that answers that. Um, that was the last question that we have, um, just two. Uh, so that's going to be it for today. Um, I have a couple more things to talk about, but first, um, thanks again, Gary. That was a really great job, and we were uh, very lucky to have you with us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, okay. For all you Bixi members, um, as we said earlier, don't forget to request your, your certificate from us uh, by sending an email to info at daspedia.com, info at daspedia.com. You are now qualified to receive one CEC credit from Bixi. Um, also, everyone, please remember to go to our events page at daspedia.com, uh, register for our wireless training seminar and networking event which will be held at uh, University of California Irvine campus in Orange County, California on January 11, 2016, uh, less than two months away. Early bird invitation only admission tickets are available there now uh, at the website. Uh, Bixi members will receive $25 discounts to our training sessions and they are worth five CEC credits. Um, also, some sponsorship opportunities are still available, so please contact us if your company is interested. Again, info at daspedia.com. Um, and last thing is that a link of today's recording uh, is of, this, of the webinar is available, um, and it will be emailed to all participants. So that is it. Everyone, thank you for coming, and don't forget to learn, share, and prosper.